I have an interview coming up in a minute with Russ Dizdar. This is going to be a tough one for a lot of folks for a lot of different reasons. Here are some clips. I was in Worthington, Ohio at the police academy called Opata. A law enforcement agent named Thomas Wedge who wrote a book called The Satan Hunter for law enforcement. So I'm going through all of this. The very evening that I get home, I get a phone call from a frantic woman who said, somebody gave me your phone number. I have a stepdaughter that's in the psych ward. She's going to kill herself. Her mother's doing, she goes into all the stories about satanic stuff and rituals and blood rituals and animals being sacrificed. And I sat down with a 13-year-old. She's there because she keeps writing over and over and over the ritual of the flames, the ritual of the flames, the ritual of the flames. When I finally got enough engagement with her to talk about it, she said it's a ritual that she has to do on her 14th birthday to prove her love for her mother, her mother, a satanic priestess. So victim, this, this little girl, as I'm engaging her, began to have other personalities come up. Again, uh, you know, my, I'm a counselor. I'm, a, I'm trained. I'm in school. I'm trained to do things. Uh, I'm, I'm listening to this 13-year-old. Then I'm listening to a male personality. Then I'm listening to another personality. Why is that so hard to accept for most people? What, and moreover, why is it completely misrepresented in the media? First, I, th- I would say the first part of this is the issue of grid. In, in the, when you talk about investigative journalists that I deal with, psychiatrists, police officers, feds, if it's not in your grid, in other words, if you're trying to deal with MS-13, a gang, they're real, they're a real gang, they're a drug gang. Uh, they're in my city now, up here in Canton, Ohio. Uh, they have certain markings, certain hand signs, um, certain clothing. So there's certain characteristics about a real gang. So when we deal with satanic crimes, very little teaching on that subject. And I want to make sure we talk about MK Ultra. You've thrown it out there. We've investigated it extensively on this show. It was in response to what they thought was a threat from Russia, who was engaged in a lot of this activity. But there was also, as you point out, and I'm sure you will, there was a direct Nazi connection where we had just picked up their research and said, gee, horrible thing that you've done, but let's see if we can do it better. Alex, you're a a million percent right on that issue. When it comes to Psy Warriors, no question about the United States knew that they had to do something in the 50s to counteract the, what they learned about the Russians, what they were doing. What nobody was saying, though, that step back like you just did, step back another step. Where did the Russians get it? Where did the the Americans get it? So you do go back to the Nazis. I mean, you don't have to go all the way there with the Nazis, but you can't deny that they were interested in the occult. You can't deny that those SS uniforms had the little skull and crossbones on them and and that they were actively trying to seek all these occult objects in order to empower what they would do. Tell us what you saw and experienced when you were in the castle in Germany. Well, and that's, that was the whole issue. Where did it come from that? We just, we kept following the trail, follow the evidence. So I'll say this real quick, modern day satanic ritual abuse is nothing less than the extension of the agenda of the master race that the Nazis started in 1939. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and as you may know by now, If you've listened to this show very much lately, you know I've been kind of into the evil thing. And I got to tell you, you know, it's not because I have any special interest or attraction to the topic. It's just it seems to me to be kind of one of the fundamental central questions we can ask about the nature of who we are, why why we're here, the whole consciousness question. Evil is something that is fundamental to that. So again, as you know, I've spent quite a bit of time exposing the completely inept, materialistic, atheistic, scientific dogma that would have us completely sidestep any of these questions, claiming that evil doesn't exist, good doesn't exist, because consciousness doesn't even exist. 
You also know we've gone a few rounds with the love and like folks who are equally convinced that evil is just something that's understood as a bad idea and can be banished with a couple of good positive affirmations. On this show, you've even heard from magic practitioners who reluctantly acknowledge the existence of evil, but fall back into the idea that it doesn't really matter as long as you marshal those spirits to join your side and ultimately do what thou wilt. Mm -hmm. But one angle we haven't covered, and that's one that we're going to cover today, is talking to someone who claims to kind of have insider knowledge about evil in a boots on the ground, fighting evil kind of way. And that's what we're going to hear today, because today's guest, Russ Dizdar, is an ordained minister, former police chaplain, and a guy who's taught college-level courses on occult and satanic crimes. Russ has worked with a number of victims of satanic ritual abuse. He's investigated satanic crimes, occult crimes, a lot of mind control stuff that's going to be very interesting and dovetail with a lot of the, the research, if you will, or interviews we've done on this show. He's the author of several books, including one that we're going to talk about today, The Black Awakening, and maybe some of his other books. You can hear him on his long-running show, Ragged Edge Radio. Russ, welcome to Skeptico. Thanks for joining me. Great to be with you, Alex. Appreciate being here today. Okay, did I, I left some stuff out of that intro. We should best start by telling folks more about who you are and how you've really, how you came to this work and then the research that you've done. Sure, I, um, I mean, we go back 40 years then. I mean, that's 40 years ago in the beginning of this. You know, I was raised in through the 60s, early 70s, lived a wild, crazy life. Um, uh, drugs, bar fight, and all those kind of crazy things. Well, I tried to clean it all up. I went, I, I got into Buddhism, went to a temple for three years, uh, got to do a lot of other things, occultism myself. Now, in the context of that, I was never raised in church, but just just to say what occurred to me in 1975, uh, for the first time I heard the message of Jesus, and, and I heard the message that he's alive, he's real, he'll come into my life, change my life. Well, all I can tell you, Alex, that night when I received Christ in my life and he came in, uh, I've known him now and known walk with God, and just, you know, knowing God and walking with God. That's where it all started as far as um, just new life for me. And, and uh, if you want to call it being born again, uh, being awakened to who God is, uh, you know, that's the, the biblical picture of that salvation. So in that, um, I, I really feel like I recognized what evil really was. I was, um, you know, there were some episodes of uh, spiritual things, entities, uh, visitations that I had prior to that salvation where I almost lost my life. Uh, so when I became a believer in Jesus, a Christian, uh, I, then I began to get into ministry. Well, from that time in the uh, late 70s on, uh, we've always engaged the underworld. I, I, um, began to deal with young people in Satanism in the late 70s. Then we got into in the early, like 1980, 1981, we got involved with satanic ritual abuse, multiple personality disorder. Can I jump in there with a question? Sure. sure. Because one of the things that, you know, straight up, we're going to have to kind of deal with is even, like I said in the intro, establishing the idea that there is such a thing as evil. And in particular, when you talk about satanic ritual abuse, you know, straight up, and you know this, most people, you go to Google and you Google satanic ritual abuse, and the first 10 pages, first 100 entries are about the hoax. So yeah. the satanic ritual abuse as this kind of meme, as this right. kind of joke. Now, it, it, we've explored it on this show in some different ways, but... I guess one of the things I was hoping you could do is from your experience in law enforcement in particular, kind of nail down that this is real, this is out there, even without 
if you would, it, without the, the religious overlay. I mean, there are people yes. out there who are doing this stuff. Absolutely. And to a certain extent, law enforcement, from what I understand in talking to some of these people, they kind of feel constricted in reporting it and talking about it. So they go out to a scene and it's a crime scene and there's all mm -hmm. sort of, sorts of satanic stuff all over the place, mm -hmm. symbols and other stuff. And they feel obligated to kind of not report that. Can, can you give us some kind of boots on the ground sure. evidence that you've had that this is something that's real mm -hmm. beyond the Google search of satanic panic, which is sure. what always comes up. Sure, and that's and that's 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 the vital part of all of it. Uh, and I was asked that on Coast to Coast years ago when it came to Satanic Panic, and you know there was a big battle over, over that whole issue in the nineteen nineties, actually. And so the big issue is then, what do we do with all the victims? Um, in, in forty years, I have worked with hundreds of victims of Satanic ritual abuse. Now, when I first began to hear about it, Alex, that's when I said, this is so bizarre. This is, you know, we know about Satanism, like Anton LaVey and popular Satanism, uh, rock and roll Satanism. We know all about that, but we didn't understand uh, this deeper level and real ritual. So I formed a team back in the early 1980s, which is now called the SIIU. It's an investigative team, private investigative team. And so we began to hunt it down. We began to go after it. Uh, when we had victims come in, we would listen to the stories. We would do what we do to help them and see them help get safety. And we're talking safe housing them, hiding them out. We can get into talking about program personalities, triggers, coven people coming, watchers. So I've got over 38 years of engaging victims, uh, extracting victims, uh, hiding victims out, spending thousands and thousands of hours with victims. So on, a, on, a, on just a, a secular look at this, the American Psychological Association, Colin Ross being one of the world-renowned psychiatrists out of Canada, he's now in the United States, he wrote a book, uh, Project Bluebird, The Purposeful Creation of Multiple Personality Disorder. And there's a, lot of, there's a ton of books now, there's a lot of content out there now. Here's what we gotta do, here's the big question that I, I, I scream at at conferences when I did teach a little bit in law enforcement, police academies, the big issue was, where did all the victims come from? You cannot have a person have split personality. That come, Everybody in psychology knows it comes from massive trauma and usually begins in childhood. So where did all of the numbers, like, for example, 1992, uh, Holly Hector from De Centennial Hospital in Denver, uh, in a book called Satan and Associates, uh, they gave an estimation of 2.4 million victims in 1992. Uh, and these are people that have the trauma-based uh, splitting of personalities and the evidence of programming and control abuses. Uh, she mentioned in her report in 19, I think, 92, that 87% of the victims they're dealing with come from a satanic ritual abuse background. Well, then jump forward 10 years or so well, to well, Colin hold on, Ross. Hold on. Let me, let, yeah. let's, let's stop right there because I, I want you to kind of nail that down a little bit yeah. more. It's an important, where you're going is super important. Yeah. And it's, it's backed up by some of the research we've done in this show from a non-Christian perspective. I am not a Christian. I, like I told you in the email, yeah. I accept the reality of extended consciousness and Christ consciousness only because I'm forced to, because that's where the data leads. You follow okay. near-death experience. People are encountering Jesus. They're encountering Christ. You can't dismiss that in the same way that you can't dismiss the entire near-death experience. But I don't want to get off on my thing. Sure. But, but I also want to kind of say that this trauma-based realization of this extended realm and connection with this extended realm is, again, something we've run across again and again and again in our investigations, again, from a non-Christian perspective. So there's a lot of overlay there. But I, I'm hoping you can maybe back up, Russ, and, you know, you've done this for so long. You've been this warrior on the front line helping people. So no matter what people think of the Christian overlay, I want to help people get more of a sense of what you've seen on a firsthand basis, like you said, maybe from more of a secular perspective, where you said, wow, this is just 
This is just undeniable. No matter what yeah. I might think about this, this is really happening. Sure. I mean, it, again, in, in that's, that's, that's one of the questions we all have to answer, regardless of any background. Uh, and, and, and as much as we've dealt with um, psychiatrists, psychologists, with no Christian overlay, when I'm in law enforcement, they don't want me to talk anything about religion. When I'm teaching in the police academy, when they allowed me to, you know, don't talk about that. Just deal with evidence and facts and, and how to investigate this stuff. So the big, the big issue is, again, victims. Why are there so many victims? Where do they come from? Why are there thousands in the 80s? hundreds of thousands in the 90s. And I do agree with the assessment that many others in the secular realm, not us, I'm quoting secular uh, content when I say they now believe Colin Ross, a secular counselor, a psychiatrist, he's world renowned knowing about all this. Um, he's written a lot about this, numerous books. He believes in an assessment of 10 million victims in the United States alone. Now, I could talk about going to Scotland, Germany, France, Poland, Canada. I could talk about how, why are they worldwide? Where, where they, how come they're in all these other continents also? Where do they come from? The DSM-3, the Diagnostic Manual, uh, the DSM-4, the Diagnostic Manual for Psychology and Psychiatry. Uh, it wasn't in there in the DSM-1 and 2. The phenomena began to pour in the late 70s. Victims began to show up everywhere, and that's what happened to us in the early 80s. Victims. My first victim, I uh, had to show up at a children's psychiatric center, a 13-year-old girl. Uh, she's writing. She has all these drawings that she's showing me. She's there because they're afraid she's going to um, commit suicide because she keeps writing over and over and over the ritual of the flames, the ritual of the flames, the ritual of the flames. When I finally got enough engagement with her to talk about it, she said it's a ritual that she has to do on her 14th birthday to prove her love for her mother, her mother, a satanic priestess. I've engaged her. I looked at all the writings, uh, the, the, the pyramid, the languages that we don't even know of, ancient languages. So I'm looking at things that I've never seen. Uh, this is like 1981, 82, 83, in these, in these early days. I'm looking at content and materials that I've not seen uh, that we all of a sudden had to scurry around and scour everywhere for information. So victim, this, this little girl, uh, as I'm engaging her, began to have other personalities come up. Again, uh, you know, my, I'm a counselor. I'm, a, I'm trained. I'm in school. I'm trained to do things. Uh, I'm, I'm listening to this 13-year-old. Then I'm listening to a male personality. Then I'm listening to another personality. Can I ask you, what, what brought you to the hospital? Paint that scene for a minute. Why sure. were you called? Who are you at that point? Uh, and then sure. pick it up from there. Sure. I was uh, in Worthington, Ohio at the police academy called Opata. Um, a, a law enforcement agent named Thomas Wedge, who wrote a book called The Satan Hunter for law enforcement, it, it Caliber Press, it was for law enforcement. He's, he's, he kind of snuck us in under the carpet to be in the police academy to go through this um, training, advanced training, no called satanic crimes. So I'm going through all of this. The very evening that I get home, I get a phone call from a frantic woman who said, somebody gave me your phone number. Uh, I have a stepdaughter that's in the psych ward. She's going to kill herself. Her mother's doing, she goes into all the stories about satanic stuff and rituals and blood rituals and animals being sacrificed. The two brothers are involved. So she's the one that begged me to go to the psych ward there in Akron, uh, children's psych ward. And I just, so, so I did. Uh, I just went to the psych ward. Uh, they, got, they had somehow get, gotten permission for me to come in. And I sat down with a 13-year-old and it, you know, that, that engagement back then has, uh, to this very day, I still know that person, and we've worked with that person. Uh, so I can go so into when talking. You, so when you say that you've worked with victims, I just yeah. want to make sure that people yeah. understand yeah. that anyone in that situation, particularly you coming from a law enforcement, you know, that's your, your training, that's going to be your career. I mean, that's just kind of real stuff that I want people to understand. When you say victims, what do you do with that evidence? And, and I guess yeah. that's a follow-on question. What additional cases did you have? And yeah. then now you're coming to the point where you're training other 
law enforcement, or you were in the past training other law enforcement professionals, how to deal with this. Number one, what do you tell them? And then number two, I get the sense that they don't really want you to do that training anymore. So how has that all evolved? Well, that, and you're right, Alex. You're absolutely right on that because I talk about it not being in the grid. Even when it comes to psychi psychiatrists, psychologists, most of them, and, and for 30-some years, psychologists, psychiatrists have been taking in victims that have they now call DID, dissociative identity disorder. They, they, all, they all have dealt with this. They have all across the United States, every psych ward, counselor, psychiatrist, they've all dealt with this for over 30 years. You can't deny the numbers. You can't deny the victims. The issue is when they start telling you stories of being in boxes with spiders and being, you know, blood and a baby and an altar and people in hoods and, and candles and strange languages. And they'll talk even about the dark side demons and all that. So the issue is, um, police officers, that's, that includes in the academy, and, and you can go through 25 criminology books, training books, uh, forensic psychology books, textbooks. I, I collect them. There's no grid, Alex. There's, they, don't, they don't teach. All the officers that I know that when we've gotten into cases and we've taken content to those officers, to federal officers, uh, the, the, it's bizarre to them. And the issue is then how do you uh, investigate this? When you take a Jeffrey Dahmer and you do catch him, he did kill those people, but nobody brought out the fact that he was multiple personality. Nobody brought out the fact that he had an altar built out of human thigh bones in his, in his apartment where he killed all those people. Nobody brought out the fact that he did this. He had a, a power cone, the shape of a triangle uh, of human skulls where you conjure Here's what, the, here's what the trainer in the law enforcement told us, Tom Wedge. He told all the law enforcement people, don't worry about what, you know, is whatever you believe, whatever your background, Christian, non-Christian, whatever it is, the point is they believe it's real. That's what matters. Uh, they so, believe- So that's, that's a really important point. There's so many yeah. points to pull apart there. One, also, yeah. just correct me if I'm wrong, but Dahmer directly said he was in contact with spiritual beings that were telling him to do this stuff. And I think he also said his father- had similar contact. And that's, and that's the point. That's what I'm saying. In, in the investigative side of this, there's no, what we call, I call a web. If I meet today, if I meet a satanic racially abused person, if they're 21 years old, here's what I know already. They are third generation. It means that they have family background where there's other multiples. They have a, a grandmother that's probably been multiple also and in, in, in in, involved in all this it, because it's generational. Uh, I'm talking 35 years of this. When we meet victims, I don't care if it's an eight-year-old in a psych ward now, in a children's psych ward, or I meet a, if I meet a 68-year-old, which, which is first generation, many of them are the MK Ultra, the Monarch. Uh, those are the ones that we have heard about the most in the, on the web and, and books and things. I could talk about the, the Fort Bragg Psy Warrior. We're going to talk about that in yeah. a minute. I'm going to bring it back, though, to something else that you just said. And, and I, I'm not just interrupting you for the sake of interrupting you that some people accuse, You're but good. you said something interesting that I want to make sure people get. From your experience with law enforcement, what I heard you say is that there's physical evidence that they have to deal with. Sure. You walk into a crime scene, there's an inverted pentagon, there's blood, ritual, circle, all this stuff. You can't get past that. So one of the things you do, this is what you're telling me, is you say, well, it doesn't matter if there's a reality to it. These people think there's a reality to it, and I have to deal with that. But then what you said, and I've heard this before, too, and people who've listened to this show, is that if we get past that kind of narrowly minded uh atheistic kind of there's no reality to any of this stuff and we start listening to these people they say oh no it's real in that yeah. i have this contact with this extended realm that's telling me to do this and then there's even evidence of them making contact with that so right. what what is what is this whole thing? Why do we get such misinformation and disinformation about this? If this is, uh, if not common, at least understood to be part of law enforcement and 
you know, we've interviewed some folks on this show, then why is that so hard to accept for most people? And moreover, why is it completely misrepresented in the media? First, I, th- I would say the first part of this is the issue of grid. In, in the, when you talk about investigative journalists that I deal with, psychiatrists, police officers, feds, if it's not in your grid, in other words, if you're trying to deal with MS-13, a gang, they're real, they're a real gang, they're a drug gang. Uh, they're in my city now, up here in Canton, Ohio. Uh, they have certain markings, certain hand signs, um, certain clothing. So there's certain characteristics about a real gang. And, and law enforcement has to learn. They have, that's why they have a gang unit. They got a drug unit. They got a sex crimes unit. Uh, the pedophile stuff's off the wall, too. So when we deal with satanic crimes, very little teaching on that subject. If they go to a location where there's a ring and candles and a inverted pentagram and ancient writing that they don't even know what it is, Malachian, Fabian, uh, Oguam, Belteshari, these ancient ritual languages that summon. So f- again, forget about the spiritual side for a moment. Let's just deal with trace evidence. Let's just deal with uh, forensic, you know, that, 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 that kind of evidence. So you got a Dahmer, you got dead bodies, you got meat human meat in the freezer you got all, but what they didn't tell you in all of the all of the documentaries even the newest one that i because I, i've watched them all what i learned when i was at def tech a swat team training in geneva ohio when tom wedge the law enforcement agent brought in the actual large books uh from Matt morris and also from from jeffrey dahmer's inside the house the crime scene pictures they didn't t- they didn't know what to do with an altar they didn't know what that was like a little table built out of human thigh bones. They didn't know what that triangle was with the skulls. What is that? So here's what I tell them when I met with, I mean, even, even in the last year, meeting with detectives in Pennsylvania, fed individuals, state troopers. Here's what I tell them. It, what they believe goes to the motivation of the crime. Forget whether you believe there's a Satan or not. They believe it. That's their motivation to slaughter and kill. Uh, we have cases of uh, two girls. I have a fed uh, billboard picture on our website. We put up a lot of Sarah and Kathy. That's our case. Uh, it, it has been taken over eventually by the feds. They've never solved the case, even though we turned over state's evidence. The fed, the, the, the primary fed now over that case uh, out of Pennsylvania, out of Pittsburgh, his whole issue was, but Russ, that's bizarre. Uh, one of the other cases in, in Allenstown, a little boy went missing. The whole story of a victim we took there after 10 years of corroborating the stories and all that. They could not, they could not when, when they sat for four hours to interrogate the victim that watched a little boy be sexually abused, richly cut, you know, killed, uh, cannibalized. The boy's never been found to this day. I think some 15, 16 years later, his name is Lewis. The detective, after all of this, said he could not deny what she had to say. Here's what he said, Alex. The detective on the case, it's just too bizarre. So this is why I'm saying that the, the grid, when, when you're going to investigate a crime, what's the motivation? What about Berkowitz, the process church? What about, what about John Wayne Gacy and Ted Bundy, both of them being multiple? Where did they get those other personalities? Uh, hold on. Let me just make sure everyone understands what you're saying when you say the grid. Because what I hear you saying is that people get locked into a certain belief system that literally makes it impossible for them to, in this case, do their job or take in information just in an objective way. That's, that's what you mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because of an atheist, like when I was in Scotland, um, not too long ago, this, this, this last year, uh, in a ritual abuse conference there, you do have strong atheists nowadays, not a lot of them, but like they just discard all of this. It's, none of this is true. So when we say to them, what do you do with the victims? What about the ritual sites? What about the symbolism? Again, in law enforcement, if they don't know what an inverted pentagram is or a pentacle, a pentacle is witchcraft and pagan. An inverted pentagram, that's satanic. Certain writings, you, if you know the language, if you know the content of the Amalantra working of Aleister Crowley, if you, if you know uh, how to read that, like I don't speak, 
I'd love, I don't speak German. I don't speak, I know a couple words. I don't speak Russian. I know a word or so. So if someone gives me a whole sentence in Russian, I'm lost. I don't know what they said. I don't know how to engage that. So when law enforcement shows up with a kid or, or, de or dead body that has uh, a, a tongue cut out or a left hand cut off or a satanic justice symbol carved into their chest in the context of a ritual site that has candles, blood, symbols, and they can't read any of that. They don't know the language. Uh, they don't know what it's for until they begin to learn, well, a satanic justice symbol imprinted, uh, that involves the fact that the coven uh, has, has uh, taken this person because they told the secrets, and satanic justice is they've killed them. And uh, part of the issue of cutting out the tongue is because they spoke, they shouldn't have. There's rituals that involve, uh, you got to understand the language of rituals. Why are certain rituals done? Uh, what what are, the, what, are they, what are they about? What do they mean? So the two girls that I talk about that we have on our site a lot, we put up uh, both of them. For example, I share, I share with a federal officer. And here's, what, again, just looking at facts, uh, Sarah Bain was abducted out of Rochester, Pennsylvania. She ended up here in Ohio in a backfield that was known for satanic rituals. Kathy Menendez, a month later, Sarah was killed slaughtered and killed on demon revels uh, early July. Uh, on the satanic calendar in August is satanic revels, Kathy Menendez. So, there, so when you look at the satanic calendar and the kind of ritual that is demanded, blood sacrifice, usually a girl between 7 and 17, when you begin to look at, and, and when you have that in the mode of operation and in, in how they operate, what they used, no different than a burglar or a cat burglar or a, a drug lord. And you, and you see the tools they use. You see the methods they use. Well, we have to learn and, and have in the grid of our understanding uh, the ritual dates, the reason for rituals, the types of rituals, and, and um, the things that are done to individuals uh, that will tell you, was this a satanic ritual? Was this a darker occult ritual in the Krolinian sense? Was this simply a meeting of, pay, uh, of Wicca and it didn't involve blood of human, but it was a ritual site and, and yet there's no blood. So you've got to know the difference between pagan, Wiccan, and, and, and just simply know their language. And okay, so I get that from a, a, a well said, and, and you're saying from a law enforcement standpoint, there's two problems. One, there's the grid problem, the belief system worldview that doesn't let this or doesn't want to allow this in because almost right. the stories you tell almost suggest like, I don't want to go there. You know, it's not I just I, I just it's too uncomfortable. And we don't expect to hear that from law enforcement, but I'm sure it's there. What game is the media playing in this? Because I kind of understand where you're going in the law enforcement grid slash worldview. But is there something more that's going on with mainstream media, Hollywood media, in terms of how they're portraying this? Yeah, and Alex, because of the, everybody has a bias. I can just say my bias is I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, uh, Bible, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, everybody has a certain bias. And so when it comes to journalists and, and no, local news media, and, and there's, there's clearly, again, their grid, their bias, they have no language for some of this stuff. But you know, we can get conspiratorial in the sense that is there a certain level, law enforcement, media, psychiatry, and so forth, that, that purposely wants to downplay this? I can tell you about being in a police academy where the trainer said to all the cadets, all the officers, all of the detectives in the whole academy, don't tell the public. If you find pentagrams, pentagrams carved into a chest, if you, if, if you find this content, don't tell the public. It'll I've heard panic. that before. Uh, well, I, was, I mean, we've seen that over and over again. We take the opposite view. That's why I'm not, that's why I'm not in law enforcement directly, although we have – we have former law enforcement that work with us. We have particular people that we work with in law enforcement uh, when it comes to crimes and death and even the issue of just sexual abuse. Uh, right. If we touch on the Catholic thing, most of the thousands and thousands of abuse folks out of the Catholic system, the courts just wanted to hear about the abuse. What we're not hearing is that many of those cases were satanic ritual abuse, the black rooms, uh, 
uh, all across multi-continental. Uh, and we, we, we've engaged it over the years. But when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to the courts, when it comes to suing an institution, here's what they tell you. Leave out all this religious stuff. Let's just deal with the physical harm, the sexual harm. Uh, let's just deal with those factors as far as uh, litigation. Uh, that, that's just something that happens constantly. And, and uh, you, well, you can, let's go conspiratorial a little sure. bit because I don't know how you can't, mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, you know, like I've told people when I started this show, I didn't have a conspiratorial angle at all. I was just following the data. Mm -hmm. I was following the data on the science meme that we're biological robots in a meaningless universe. I was like, that's bullshit. Of course we're more than that. I don't know what we are. You know, I know my Christian upbringing told me one thing, but I'm open to whatever it was. But why is there this meme in science, this atheistic meme? And why has it survived so long when all the evidence points in the other direction? That yeah. led me to believing that there's, there's a conspiratorial angle to that. There's a reason why that meme, why that grid, if you will, that worldview gets perpetuated. And I got to tell you, I, I just see the same thing here all over the place. I mean, the way this is reported is just absurd. It's just so distorted from the reality that if anyone does five minutes of research, they go, wait, that's not true. Yeah. Sure, there are. There, and let's get this out there. There are cases of satanic panic. There are satanic hoaxes. There are uh, the, the woman in England who uh, is in a custody battle with her husband, even though she's had her kids taken away from her a couple times because she's not a good mom. She raises the, you know, satanic panic flag and, and it right. has a certain effect. Those things happen. That's a reality. But it's so the way that reality gets portrayed in the media versus this other reality that you're talking about, which far outweighs it in terms of number, in terms of importance, yeah. and in terms of yeah. everything else. How do you not see that as some kind of controlled release of this information? Well, I mean, and again, I think in a law enforcement, even in a psych just in a, in a societal way, look at the drug lords. Do they not operate secretively? Do they not operate in, in threat of punishment if the, any of their people would, you know, test? What about the mafia? Do they not operate in a secretive way? Organized crime does. The drug lords do. Um, human trafficking of, um, of millions of kids and boys and girls. They operate in a deep secrecy and a, and a fear factor. Uh, if you get out and telling, you know, uh, uh, what is it, snitches uh, get stitches. Yeah. Uh, so, there is, there is this whole issue of um, the fear factor. So what I keep telling everybody then, just keep dealing with the individual victims because you cannot have split personality without massive trauma, usually sexual, mental, emotional, over and over again. Everybody knows that in psychiatry. You can't be DID without that. Then the other question is, why are there, why are there so many of them? Why have they all of a sudden shown up everywhere? Every, so th we deal with that part of it. If you're going to engage a child, is there sex? There's certain indicators. Look at the private parts of a child or a young person, or in a rape case with law enforcement. Is there evidence of a rape? Is there evidence of sexual abuse? Are there marks? Are there tears? Are there, you know, so all of the forensic evidences in a rape case, in a sexual abuse case, that has to come into play. So if someone comes forward and says, I've been raped, I've been, this happened and these people and my uncle did this and the teacher at the school did this and they've been, I've been raped four times and it occurred last night and it occurred last week. Well, they go in to get a physical checkup by, by competent doctors and multiple doctors and they're all saying, this person hasn't been touched or this girl's still a virgin and she hasn't been touched. There's no physical markings. There's no, tear, you know, vaginal tears. You know, none of the characteristics of real physical stuff occurred. So that's, that then begins to tell you, you know, the, you know, follow the evidence. This is what we say in law enforcement, follow the evidence. The problem is sometimes they don't follow it all the way, though. Let me make sure I understand what, what you're saying, because I don't want people to get the wrong impression. Yeah. You're saying cases that are misreported or intentionally fabricated can pretty easily, in a lot of cases, when people are talking about physical abuse, law enforcement has a lot of experience in that they can get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. What I hear you saying over and over again is, what do you do with the fact that 
they get to all that and they go, yes, this really did happen. And then they're forced to deal with the eyewitness testimony, the experience or the victim who says, and this is how it happened. I was brought into a circle. These people had hoods. They were doing these crazy ceremonies and all the rest of that. And you're right. saying what they do is they have to accept the physical evidence of, in this case, maybe sexual abuse. But yeah. then they seem to not be able to deal with everything else, which is kind of a strange way of handling the data. Right. Because, you know, for let's just say, let's take like a forensic attitude towards multiple personality disorder individuals. What everybody pretty much knows is that means there's been mental, emotional, and most likely physical and sexual abuses that cause such trauma that it tore the personality. So there's no debate on that subject. It's in the DSM-3s, DSM-4s. That's all secular content. Uh, that's, that's, world, you know, that's worldwide on that issue, on, on the, that. Now, if you have a person coming forward that they were raped by a coven, I can, let me just give you one story, raped by a coven, this thing occurred. Uh, so when we hear these stories, this is what we started doing, Alex, way back in the 80s. We decided we we're going to go after, is there really a location? They gave us a location. Is there really a barn there? Is there a, is there a basement? Is there a secret door? Is there a, is it in a wooded area, in a cemetery area? Is there a lid we can lift off and look in there and see what, what they've told us? So when we hear, hear the content or over the years, Hundreds of times we've taken victims with us. I said, you, go, you show us. You take us to the spot. You show us where it occurred. So if we, in, in some cases, uh, blatant evidence, very, very clear. In, in other cases, uh, it's not here any longer. Uh, they must have moved it. Uh, there's no, the, the, the pentagram on the floor is gone. Uh, so that's when you have to, as an investigator, look at the facts and begin to see, uh, is this a domestic thing where somebody's just trying to get custody and it's, it's you know, and that's, that's, that's bad enough where, where maybe one of the sp a spouse is trying to tell, uh, get the child to say uh, all the sexual abuse occurred or satanic abuse occurred only to get custody and only to have the other spouse put away. It's pretty, it's, it's also a crime to accuse somebody of things they've never been, they've never done. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, um, it's also abuse when you accuse somebody of being a Satanist, a pedophile or whatever, and there's no possibility that they are. So again, following evidence is very, very key. But if that evidence includes weird ancient languages, you, you maybe you did find a site, maybe you did like we did, a, find a basement that had blood all over it, that had symbols on the wall. Uh, what did the symbols mean? What did the language mean? Why are words written backwards? So all of that has meaning to the people that sacrificed an animal or sacrificed a human being or did a sex ritual uh, with tie downs. Of course, if you find pictures or if you find flash drives, that's, then you're talking more smoking gun stuff. And, and um, that's part of the whole of investigating. So I don't have any problem with an atheist saying, well, I don't believe any of this. I don't think any, it's all like when Kenneth Lanning, the federal officer back in the nineties that went out and say, I, I've, I've searched this out and I studied all the uh, investigate. There's no, there's no, there's no nationwide satanic ring. No, Kenneth Lanning, the federal officer made most of those investigations by phone calls from his office. Kenneth Lanning, the FBI federal officer, and this is where I'll get myself in trouble with this, ended up in the psych ward himself. I'm not going to listen to Kenneth Lanning. I'm going to listen to the hundreds of victims that I personally dealt with, to the thousands that are across the board, and here's what we have to answer. Who did this to them? What tools did they use? Because you can, you, can, you, can, you can be brutally sexually abused as a three-year-old and also split in your personality, and it didn't involve Satanism. Uh, most of the SRA or the, or the DID issues do involve Satanism, a very sophisticated kind. So if you think in terms of uh, satanic ritual abuse, think in terms of mafia, think in terms of drug lord um, terror, if you tell uh, such secrecies. If we can understand that there's drug lords and drug cartels that are global billion dollar industries that nobody can bring down. And they're sophisticated. They even use drones now. 
then we know that, you know, and most of the drug pimps, most of the drug lords are not caught. Most of the mafia people, most of the mafia crime, they're not caught. Uh, when it comes, so when you step- it's not, it's not too hard to extend that and say, if we know there is this issue of satanic yeah. practices tied to crime, why would we not at the very least expect the same kind of activity being performed? And I'm with you 100%. And I love that you're trying to apply kind of a secular filter to it, which I appreciate because that's not your orientation. And you have a particular view on yeah. that, which we will hear and, and we need to hear. Let me switch gears because you've brought this up a couple of times, and I want to make sure we talk about the MK Ultra. You've thrown it out there. We've investigated it extensively on this show. Mm -hmm. We've also investigated just the psi phenomena and psi researchers. But tell me what you think yeah. MK Ultra is all about and sure. what these people were doing because there is, I want to inject a little bit of my overlay, my grid, if you will, is that initially when a lot of this stuff started, it was in response to what they thought was a threat from the enemy, if you will, the enemy being Russia, who was engaged in a lot of this activity. But there was also, as you point out, and I'm sure you will, there was a direct Nazi connection where we had just picked up their research and said, gee, horrible thing that you've done, but let's see if we can do it better kind of thing. Alex, you're a, a million percent right on that issue because that's part of the issue of 30 some years of researching it and wanting to have the facts and wanting to have those things uh, because if they're really there, then we need to deal with it. If it's really that content, we need to understand, understand it, what it is. So you're absolutely right. When it comes to Psy Warriors, no question about the United States uh, knew that they had to do something in the 50s to counteract the what they learned about the Russians, what they were doing. What nobody was saying, though, that, that step back like you just did, step back another step. Where did the Russians get it? Where did the, the Americans get it? Then when you do a little further research, where did the Brits get it? Where did the Canadians get it? Where did the Australians get it? Uh, they all went into some of these projects. Uh, so you do go back to the Nazis. And I know that some will say it's just pure conspiracy, but you could read, a, I, I could read 200 books on the Nazi regime and all that they did. Everything, everybody knows they taught about a master race. They believed in a master race. Whether we want to believe in the spiritual side of that, forget that part of it again. Did they really, did Himmler really believe that they could backbreed to become the great super soldiers or the god men, small g. Uh, did he really believe that? Absolutely. He, he was a breeder. He, he, he believed that. So he believed the spiritual doctrine. He, I believe Hitler did that too. And, and, and many of the top SS, they believed in this so much so they created Lebensborn, the secret birthing centers all over Germany in the 1938, 1939, 1940, where they took Germans that they thought they could prove had the occult version of the Aryan blood, the God men, if they could just make them mate and breed the next generation, the new Lebensborn babies, the, the new uh, master race babies, they would have they would become more powerful. We'll use them as soldiers and they would continue that process. So there's no question about they believed in a master race that they actually applied that to genetic birthing centers. Uh, they um, believed in it so much so that Himmler said, you, anybody can find, now you can find this quote on the web. Himmler said, if we could create but 200 million of these super soldiers or these godmen, these Nordic, um, uh, hyperhumans or hybrid humans, as he called them. If we could do, if we could build but 200 million, not only could we conquer the earth, you know, conquer the world, but we could maintain it, rule it for a thousand years. Now, that's what he believed. It, it, bizarre, yes. Yeah, stupid, yes. Of course. Um, I've been to Auschwitz. I've stood in the gas chambers. I we we've, we've tracked this to Himmler's castle. I've been in the Hall of the Dead. Tell us about that story, the, that your trip to the Hall of the Dead, and again, the physical evidence that you found, you know, the symbolism, what we know now happened. You know, a lot of people are interested in the Nazi occult link and yeah. 
people have a lot of different spins on it, but mm -hmm. it's undeniable. It's yeah. undeniable that they were heavily, heavily influenced by that. And then we pick that up as you're going to talk about in a minute with MK Ultra and say, sure. well, gee, golly, gee, just to defend our country, if the spirits can be on our side, if the demons can be on our side, we better get them on our side, which is kind of a bizarre, for most of us, is kind of a completely bizarre idea. In the same way, we'll t maybe we'll talk later about yeah. Aleister Crowley in the desert, you know, trying to bring about the Antichrist with L. Ron Hubbard is the guy he's right there yeah. participating in that and creates yeah. Scientology. And there's also links to Mormonism that maybe we won't, we will, or will not get into, but all that stuff sure. is like document. I just interviewed, let me go on for just a second. Here. I just yeah. interviewed Dr. Hugh Urban from Ohio State University, comparative religion professor, written a book on Scientology and written a book on cults in general. But mm -hmm. He documents very carefully that exactly this happened, this ritualistic ceremony in the desert of the United States to bring about the Antichrist. These guys were serious about that. And yet we treat it in, in academia. Even Dr. Urban just kind of blows by that and goes, okay, and here's the next thing to deal with, as if we can completely divorce ourselves from the potential spiritual reality, whatever you believe, whether you have a Christian overlay on that, or whether you think that you have to look beyond the Christian overlay. And I guess I'd tie that back to your yeah. thing about Germany and the Nazis, because it's yeah. the same thing, folks. I mean, you don't have to go all the way there with the Nazis, but you can't deny that they were interested in the occult. You can't deny that those yeah. SS uniforms had the little skull and crossbones on them, and, they, and that they we're actively trying to seek all these occult objects in order to empower what they would do. I mean, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, they didn't, it, Lucas didn't, didn't make that up out of thin air. There was a reality to all that. So yeah. with that and, and me going on, tell us what you saw and experienced when yeah. you were in the castle in Germany. Well, and that's, that was the whole issue. Where did it come from? That we just, we kept following the trail, follow the evidence. So I'll say this real quick, modern day, if you want to call it MK Ultra, it's kind of old, but modern day MK, MK Ultra here, modern day satanic ritual abuse is nothing less than the extension of the agenda of the master race that the Nazis started in 1939. There's a reason they believed it. There's a reason why, like think in terms, Alex, of the final solution. When the Nazis met in a secretive meeting to discuss the camps they would build, the ovens that would be built to be large enough, the way in which they would uh, gather up the Jews and others and gypsies and so forth and, and how they can bring them down to the camps. Uh, they sat there in a sophisticated way that involved engineering, that involved uh, moving, the, it involved so many things in plotting and planning their, the final solution in eradicating uh, Jews, gypsies, whoever else was in their way. So that all occurred. The camps, you know, there's 900 of them or so, actually more than just a few. So the same thing's true concerning, you know, when I wanted to know where, where are thousands or even millions of satanic richly abused, multiple personality, all this, where is it coming from? So we kept tracking and tracking, and we've had over three decades that led us to Germany. When we met Fort Bragg Psy Warriors, when I met a federal officer's wife, first, here's a, here's a point that's important. In the first generation of multiple personality disorder that started in the late 70s, early 80s, when 30-year-olds and others were starting to come in, the psychiatric community, psychology community, they didn't know what to do. And, and they began to, every psych ward, all the counselors were getting them. So they came up with the DSM-3, and they, they said, here's the diagnostic uh, tests and the evidences for multiple personality disorder, that phrase. Um, so that the psych wor world began to deal with that. Be they had to deal with that, but they didn't go tracking it. They dealt with that in an academic way. They dealt with that in the office way. Our way of dealing with it was we're going to go take this to the ends of the earth and we're going to search. We're going to go wherever we need to go, which led us to Germany. So I'm going to tell you this modern day MK ultra, the military side is a sanitized version 
of the development of a master race, an altered human, uh, a enhanced humans. That's what psi warriorism is all about. Whether Russian, whether the United States, whether remote viewers at, at Fort Meade in Stargate, uh, the, the Fort Bragg goat lab where they were using psi powers to explode the, the heart of a goat, those that were in the program that we dealt with personally, they were there. They knew that, Alex. They, the folks that knew Sidney Gottlieb directly, the folks that know John Alexander, the folks that know Stubblebine, all these folks that we dealt with on that level, uh, there's no question about the research level, the reality level, the books that are involved, but the people that are involved also. David Morehouse, uh, psychic warrior, one of the remote viewers out of Stargate. So when you, when you deal with all of them, all of that content, you track it backwards. It all goes back to the Nazis. It all goes back to their belief system, spiritual. It all ended up like, the, like, like Nazi ideology was actually spiritual revelation. Whether we want to, we don't, we don't, you don't have to say, people say, can say, I don't believe in that. Well, they did. They believed they, they were engaging non-human entities. In the Hall of the Dead in the Himmler Castle, in which Himmler was going to turn the, the Himmler castle was going to be turned into a, a, the, the, the place in which they would rule the world from. So down in the Hall of the Dead is where rituals were done. Down in the Hall of the Dead is where the 13 skulls were put in the indentions. Down in the Hall of the Dead is where Himmler and Hitler villigot the ancient sorcerer that was taken out of the psych ward in Germany, and Himmler had him as the primary sorcerer. They're doing rituals in that, in that, in that Hall of the Dead that I stood in very charged, spiritually charged place. So from that place and after the war and all the Nazi doctors and all the scientists were taken, here's what anybody can do. Track the Nazi rat lines. In the early 50s to mid 50s, wherever the rat lines went in all the world, South America, South Africa, Johannesburg, Pretoria, into Chile, to Argentina, Wherever the rat lines went, guess what happens? You can now track the emergence, 25 years later, the emergence of the victims of, of multiple personality, mind control, imical, they begin to show up. In Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, South America, all over Europe, in Britain, whoever... Whoever, wherever the rat lines went in the, in the Catholic church system nationwide, wherever the Nazi became fake priests, wherever they went and were not captured, were not dealt with, didn't go to Nuremberg, they continued the project. The project both has a, a spiritual component that you could speak to, but it also has what you're referring to, and I can confirm from everything I've found, has a technological, if you will, component to it. Sure. So does. that's when you say sanitized. Mm -hmm. you, you could also use the word, you know, perfected. So when they brought it into the lab at Stargate and Stanford Research Institute and Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, yeah. I'm not saying that those guys in there, Sidney Gottlieb, you know, the doctor, respected doctor, but many people outwardly say that he's the Joseph Mengele of the United States. So there's an undeniable reality to what you're talking about. How do you parse that, though? How do you parse the technology component, the good soldier component of I'm asked to do a job, uh, I'm John Alexander, I'm told to do this stuff, I'm Joe McMonagle, I'm told to do this stuff, and I do it because that's my assignment, and I can see some immediate intelligence payoff for this. I mean, if I can sure. remote view enemies' sure. location around the world, that doesn't seem to me to be sure. Nazi evil. How, right. how do you parse the, as you said it, you know, the, the sanitized version of it that seems to have a genuine intelligence component with... What you're talking about, which is really kind of challenging, but I think people have to deal with it, is the super spiritual aspect of this. Sure. Well, I think at this point now, the physical side, the reality of MK Ultra, Monarch, you know, mind control, uh, program shooters, 
there, I think that there's so many victims, so many have been investigating now for decades. I mean, I've been involved 38 years in direct investigation of it in the direct working with victims and all over the place, including military ones, including in McAltra, including these individuals. And that, that occurs to this very day. We got cases all around us. We have threats all around us. I was at the Mind Control Conference in Richmond, Virginia, when Alan Shefton, Corey Dunn Hammond, talked about the Green Bomb, the famous Green Bomb speech. I was there at that conference. They, they believed, they were not Christians, they believed that there was a nationwide conspiracy. Uh, they acknowledged the CIA's involvement. They acknowledged CIA, CIA, CIA presence in that meeting. Um, Corey Dunn Hammond was getting out of it because of the threats that he got. But let me do this, Alex. Let me hold up something to you. This book here, I don't know if you've ever seen this book. I quoted this in my book, The Black Awakening, 10 years ago. I, I keep mentioning it left and right. You can get it on Amazon probably for about 100 bucks, 150 bucks now. I'm, I'm amazed that there's hardly anybody in all of the books. I buy every book I can find that's out on MKUltra, every single book on the subject. I mean, that's, that's what we do. That's what our teams do. This book right here is written by G.H. Estabrooks. World-renowned renowned psychologist, psychiatrist in the 1950s, world-renowned, head of the global kind of like the World uh, American Psychological Association, the Psychological Association of the World. He's considered one of the greatest psychologists, psychiatrists worldwide. U.S. military hires him. They, he begins to work with them. This book is put out here in a chapter called Weaponizing. Here's what he says. In 1947, this is put out in 1947. Here's what he says. Just like you're saying, we in the arms race, in the battle of developing weapons and so forth, we know that we have to do anything and everything to be ahead of everybody else. Uh, he says here in, in that chapter on weaponization, we learned how to take soldiers, create, here's his, his terminology, create multiple personalities, create an alter personality. We learned how to program those sub-personalities to be active assassin shooters, disinformation agents, spies, infiltrators. We've learned how to program them, give them a trigger, and put them down inside the soldier without the soldier knowing what's really there. You know what he, you know what he says in this book in 1947? He says, I think he spilled the beans and they've tried to cover it up since. Here's the guy that did all the stuff. Here's the guy that did the stuff with Sidney Gottlieb, with uh, all those people back in that day. He said, what we need to do, after he, he explains and details the effectiveness of creating ultra personalities, creating the spies, the, the program shooters, the assassins, and so forth, and how that works and how successful they were, he also details this. G.H. Estabrook says, I didn't say this, he did. He says, we need to create these super soldiers and place them in every department of U.S. military so that down the road we can have a hidden fifth column of these super soldiers to call up if we need to. That's in this book under weaponization he would have known all, he would have been at the very forefront of MK Ultra. This book was put out in 1947. So this, this psychiatry knew this stuff. Psychologists knew this stuff. You know where he got it from? From the Nazis. You know, Russ, this is powerful stuff that you're bringing forward. And I love when you reference the, the direct connection there. And I think it helps people because, you know, Nazi is a, such a hard word. It, it yeah. immediately discredits. A lot of people just go, okay, Nazi, I'm out of here. But in this case, as you're documenting, you can't, folks. You just mm -hmm. have to go and follow the data and, and say, why did this happen? You know, why did these guys wind up here? Why people know Project Paperclip? Why did that mm -hmm. happen? What was the source of that? Mm -hmm. I would bring it for folks who, who, don't like that angle and are more into the modern thing. Go watch the video from Darren Brown, famous UK mentalist, atheist. I mean, very outwardly in a way that I think is kind of ridiculous. The atheists just sound kind of silly to me at this point, but he's an outspoken atheist. He's a mentalist, but he shows you how to mind control someone to set him up to do 
uh, Saran Sirhan Manchurian candidate thing. He does the whole thing. And the guy goes into a theater and he pulls a gun. He doesn't know that the gun only has blanks in it. But there it is. I mean, there's the demonstration. And again, secular, this guy doesn't have anything about it. And if you go to the Saran Sirhan, Sirhan case, I guess I'm old enough that I kind of remember it, but a lot of people have forgotten it. I mean, this is the murder of Robert F. Kennedy. And, you know, in in L.A. when he's about to take the nomination and there's eight bullets they pulled out of the wall and there's only six bullets in Sirhan Sirhan's gun and they go and right. when they get Sirhan Sirhan he's just as you're talking about as I've heard you talk about and maybe you can bring us up to date on these modern day shooters but it's the same thing you look into his eyes and you go something's not right here and the guy goes I don't know where I was I don't know what happened there's this complete memory erasure thing and when you look at the documents that were forced out by the Canadian government on MK Ultra, they go, yeah, that's what we're trying to do, basically erase people's brain. And then it's very, it's, it's impossible to deny that they were doing the rest of this stuff. So, oh man, I can only imagine your frustration at two levels. I mean, we haven't even, again, we've kept the spiritual side of this out of this discussion. And I think that that maybe helps bring people along, but maybe you want to speak to either one of those those points that I raised in terms of uh, how this is kind of controlled, this information in terms of what we know and why it turns people off. What is your understanding of the spiritual component of it? And how do you make that fit into the larger problems that people have with religion, particularly yeah. with Christianity? You know, Christianity, a lot of people would say would be the last ones we'd want to turn to to try and, particularly the Catholic Church, which is the original, it is Christianity. And now it's understood to be systematically, institutionally, completely corrupted. Doesn't mean that there aren't good people in there, but as an institution, boy, oh boy, I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah, because it all, yeah, because like someone say, you keep backing up and, and all the things you're bringing into it is important because the facts need to be there. Let me throw one thing out, and here's why. Here, this is what stuns law enforcement, even psychologists. Here's what. The, here's what even the psychs know. When you have a first generation MK Ultra, or you know, SR, you know, person that says they have multiple personalities, and they've been diagnosed, and they are, and they have personalities. Here's the question I had to come up with: Why do all of them that we've dealt with, all the first generation ones, who are now between 55 and 72? It would all begin. It began there. The 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 development of splitting them began in the early fifties, and they you know they're so they're born in like fifties and up from that point on. So all of those victims, by the hundreds of thousands of them, where do they come from? Who did this to them? Why do why do all of them, Alex inside, have a personality that comes up that speaks fluent German? Every single one of them, every single one of the first generation all have personalities that speak fluent German. Many of the second generation, even down to the third generation, 21 year olds, um, they also can do this. So there's a reason why, that's why you take that, you know, it's kind of, it's one thing to, to web and investigate the outside of everything. And then to track, where did it come from? Who did this? The grandfathers did this, these mothers did this. For example, if I have a 21 year old, and this is a case, numerous cases we have right now, if I have an SRA 21-year-old, 25-year-old, here's what I already know. Probably the mother is multiple and the grandmother is multiple and the grandmother and the grandfather came from Germany. We already know this is a generational thing and backs up to the Germans. This is repeated over and over and over and over and over in cases. So you can get at the forensic investigative side of this. You can get at the, you know, where it's coming from, who did this, what the agenda is. Then we can ask, why did, you, why did the United States military take this in? My belief, they've been given a Trojan horse. They didn't know, they were given a gift. They thought the Nazi technology, they thought the Nazi enhancement, they thought the Nazi concept of super soldier, uh, psi warriors would be an enhancement. They didn't know it came with a lot of other stuff. Uh, so that's a set, there's, so there's, there is a, in, in my view, in my personal belief about this, I believe our U.S. military was infiltrated purposely along the way from the end of the 40s, early 50s. And this is where monarch, 
this is where modern day remote viewing even came from. And we can get into that issue too, because all, all of the SRA multiple personality victims that we've dealt with have trained remote viewer personalities, all of them. Where'd that come from? Well, and, and, and even though many of the early remote viewers, and this is important because we've dealt with a lot. Uh, David Morehouse is a, a direct individual we dealt with. We've in, in listened to for years and years, Ed Dames, McMahon Eagle, Monroe, Smith. Um, you can go on, Lynn Buchanan. You can go back to all of them. And though they say, in a sense, hardwired wise, there is a reality that we can do some of this stuff. But Ed Dames has come out to acknowledge what we've been screaming about for years and years and years. Ed Dames came out with it. SciTech came out with it. They're now all acknowledging that the presence, the way they're able to remote view is they go passive. They connect to the Akashic records. They connect to the hall of records. They connect to an outside source. We've said that all along. We said it with uh, Edgar Mitchell when we were in Roswell. Uh, when, when he was promoting Homo Nautica, Homo Lumos, uh, the new development of humanity. Uh, there's more to remote viewing, and it is an advantage. If you could remote view where the sniper is, like when, when uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Shannon in the 1st Earth Battalion manual that the Fort Bragg Psy Warrior brought to me, it's now on the web, you can get that free on the web now, so this manual was to teach U.S. soldiers how to, do, how to, how to be clairvoyant, how, how to engage with te telekinesis, powers of uh, how to use these super abilities. It's the super soldier warfare. manual. You know, if people hear this stuff, and again, I, I love that you reference it. If they're kind of freaked out, oh, this guy's off the wall. No, go look it up. I mean, they're directly talking about super soldiers. I mean, yeah. that's... And they've, they actually had... Many, many, so you know, many have been trained in that. So it's not, it, it's lack of knowledge. When I, that's why I'm saying back in the early 80s, Alex, when we first got to engage this, I know what salvation is, what real demons are. That's me. I know all that stuff. We dealt with that for years and years and years and years. But when it came to the multiplicity thing, when it came to personalities that were programmed, when it came to a federal officer's wife that we dealt with and a Fort Bragg Psy warrior and, and other military individuals that came in, most all of them victims wanting out of this, wanting freedom. Well, we had to ask those questions. Where did it come from? What's it connected to? And there are credible sources along the way that not just, not just going way back to Project Paperclip, but more intricately to see where that led down the road. Uh, and so when people say today, well, where did all these victims of mind control or DID, where do, where, where do they come from? Why do they keep showing? Why have more and more? We have more now than we did 30 years ago. It's still an active issue. Uh, not only in the United States, but in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Scotland, which I was just there last year uh, for a ritual abuse conference on this very subject. Uh, England is saturated. Uh, obviously, in Germany, it's massively saturated. And, and, the, and the Russians have took, taken this in too. So, we can go back and just stop right there and say, well, the Germans did it because they thought it would give them advantage. The Germans did it because they thought they could create an enhanced or an augmented human or an augmented soldier. Uh, that's ultimately what they thought they wanted, an augmented soldier. And they used the terminology, not us, they did. They used the terminology God-man or a hybrid almost. So you mentioned the ritual in Mojave Desert by Jack Parsons. It's connected to the Crowley. So Jack Parsons, the, the American rocket scientist, JPL, scientist. Here's a renowned scientist out of Pasadena. He's already known to be into satanic rituals, dark things, and so forth, the people around him. They all know that. But he goes out to the uh, Mojave Desert. Not only does he do the Babylon working. The Babylon with, and the guy who's there kind of playing aid or whatever is L. Ron Hubbard, yes. Scientology founder. So yeah, here and then go please continue with the story. Sure. And so they're there and whether anybody wants to believe this or not, they're doing a ritual. And and, and and as far as criminality, 
if there's a woman involved in a sex ritual that she's compliant with and they're doing a ritual and they're, they're doing any mumbo jumbo, who, law enforcement doesn't care about that. So that ritual was um, not a, in a sense of a criminal thing. So nobody in law enforcement could come and say, stop this. So the, but the ritual, what was the ritual all about? The, the ritual was all about Aleister Crowley's moon child. Uh, it was all about the, the possibility. They believed that in the inciting and the summoning, now they believed that there was the big entity, the whore of Babylon, the, the, the entity that could come. And this entity could come in the context of the ritual. The sex ritual would involve a supernatural charging of conception that in the, in the act of uh, that sexuality and in the actual moment of conception, that non-human presence could um, be spliced in to augment the new being, and the new being would be a hybrid, a human, non-human mix. And it's so it's a Antichrist. I mean, they it was the Antichrist specifically, according again to their beliefs, whether sure. we believe them or not. That was yes. what they were summoning through the whore of Babylon. And like I said, folks, if they will have already right. heard, people who listen to the show will have already heard Dr. Hugh Urban from Ohio State University, who doesn't really have any skin in the game. He's just saying, yeah. this is the history of Scientology. This is what we know. So yeah, that's, that's pretty stunning. And, and, and this is why it's of interest to me. And I'll just, I'll just throw this in real quick on a biblical side in a biblical prophetic side in the, in the, the, the concept of what will, if Satan's real, what is he going to do? So just on that whole side of the fence, here's, here's what I believe about the so-called antichrist. He is counterfeit to the real incarnation. In the incarnation, you have God, you know, the Bible picture is God Almighty causes the conception in a, in a woman, Mary, that's bloodline genetically all the way back to Adam. So a real pure human being. So you have the, at the moment of conception, uh, something miraculous occurs and you have in the biblical picture, the God man, God in human flesh, the logos becomes human flesh. So that's just the biblical picture. Now let's go to the satanic side and they want to bring in antichrist, the Greek word antichristu, meaning and instead of, opposed to, but also instead of the real Christ, antichrist. How is he going to come about? Now, here's what I believe. And we know, we know over the years, Alex, and this is where we're getting into the spiritual side of it, I guess, um, all those ritual things and manuals that we confiscated, all the discussions with, with, the, with those who knew how to summon and explained in detail these kind of rituals. Whether we want to believe this or not, here's what they say. The reason that um, in the creation of multiple personality disorder, which is just, that's just a secular term. If we want to use this, the Luciferian terminology or Aleister Crowley's or Jack Parsons' uh, concept, they were creating Babylon working babies. They were wanting to see their belief that all these SRAs all over the planet right now are Babylon working babies. They are the attempt to go backwards to recreate and bring about a splicing in and an altered human, if not a direct hybrid human. Uh, that's what the that's what the Babylon working was in the Mojave Desert. That's what the actual rituals done in order to select cause conception and produce an SRA split personality mind control. That's not where it stops. Whether we believe it or not, they believe they have possibly altered DNA or spliced in DNA, just like geneticists believe they can take a gene from a Panther that enables it to see at night, splice it into a soldier's DNA and the soldier being able to see. You know the studies on the frog that can grow up and glow. You take the, 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 the gene from, the, from the, the firefly and you put it into the frog, and now the frog, with that gene spliced in, now that frog can glow. There's science behind this. Uh, there's physics behind this. There's physics concerning the incarnation. There's physics concerning the, um, the well, what do you want to call it, the counter in, uh, incarnation of the Antichrist. Not only has Crowley tried, not only has Jack Parsons tried, 
But I, I, I think that um, I was at the 2045 meeting in Lincoln Plaza, New York, when Dmitry Itzkov, the Russian billionaire, uh, Google's head guy, Ray Kurzweil, all the genetics, I was at that meeting of the transhumanists. Did you know that the transhumanists uh, all believe in a, you know, they're trying to, to, to develop immortality, to wipe out death. On that same stage with the geneticists, scientists, inventors, with gene splicers, with Ray Kurzweil and, and all the rest of them, they brought in Russian cosmists who put on the screens, the big screens up that we saw on the stage. This is what they said, it's not what we said. The Russian cosmos said that the ancient gods of the skies are guiding the modern day inventors and scientists and guiding them to help bring about immortality for man because the ancient gods desire a return of the God men. So the mot there's motivation even in the deep science of transhumanism. There's elements of what we saw in Nazism in the 1939-1940 development of Lebensborn. You know, that's, that's incredible. And I, I have confirmation that we did a whole show on the whole CERN ritual, you know, the large uh, hydron collider. I've and, been there. Yeah. And, you know, the ritual that they performed at the opening of that, it blew people away. And people were like, why are we doing all these pagan rituals that have all this, these entities that we're bringing in? What is the connection there? And there's something deeper coming on. You've been incredibly generous with your time. You mentioned in the email that we might have another chat. There's a lot more to talk about. I'd love to talk to you about near-death experience, because I think that plays into this. And in particular, there's, there's some crossover with people like Joseph McMonagall, psychic spy number 001, who has a near-death experience. And when he shows up at Stanford Research Institute, lo and behold, they pull the Raymond Moody book out of his file, Raymond Moody being the guy who coined the term near-death experience. Right. There's a number of people who've had a near-death experience who see that as a Christian experience. I have a couple of them up here on the, on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. But there's a lot to process there, but I'm not sure we could get to all of it and do it in a way that really does it justice. So will you come back and have another talk about some of that stuff? Please? Alex, you're fun to talk with. I'm, I would love, we've only scratched the surface of this content. And, um, and again, we can bring out, track the evidences, 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 and then we can get to the, is there a spiritual backdrop? Is there a spiritual motivation behind all this? And what does it ultimately lead to? Uh, we can get into that also, but I would love to come back, and I appreciate you having me on. Okay, that's great, Russ. Tell people more about what they can do. You produce a tremendous amount of content, very high-quality content. You're doing real investigations, and you're talking about those investigations. Tell people how they can follow your work and learn more about what you're doing. Sure. Well, the, the main website we have is shatterthedarkness.net. Um, and there's no question, there's a, it's a Christian backdrop. I have no question about who I am. But I'm, you got to understand me. I'll talk with anybody, any place, anywhere, anytime. And we're engaged with all this information. So we put out a lot of information. I wrote a, a 600 and some page book on the subject matter that deals with the, the, the factors we're talking about, but it deals with the spiritual side of it called the Black Awakening. And that term came off the lips of a Fort Bragg Psy warrior they ripped my shirt open to see if I was wired, that if I was recording them. And they, t they, they said, you have no idea what's coming. You have no idea what's going to happen to the United States. You have no idea of the undercurrent and the coming chaos. So part of the, uh, I put that book, I put that term there purposely to discuss, you know, why are, if, if there's really worldwide over 50 million of them, why are they here? Who created them? What, what, we know what the Nazis wanted, but right now, modern day, who, why do, who wants to use them? And so we, that has to be addressed and looked into. Uh, so www.shatterthedarkness.net, that's the main site. It'll give you tons of content, like you said, hours and hours of subjects. We touch on all of these things, and, uh, and uh, we'd be 
we'll be glad to try to respond to anybody that connects with us. Well, fantastic. I, I, I'm super impressed at your ability, uh, like you said, Russ, the anytime, anywhere thing impresses me to no end because the number of people who say they can do that and then can't do that, can't handle the questions that people really have because they're outside of their grid, as you say, or their worldview. And you certainly stand up to that. You, you, I, I very impressed with the way you handled all the questioning and I look forward to talking to you again. We'll, we'll have a great follow on conversation. So thanks so Sounds much good. for us. Best of luck. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks again to Russ Dizdar for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is Nazis? Really? Nazis? You're going to go there? Haven't I always said whoever says Nazis first loses? I don't know. I said it in the interview. I'll say it again. I'm super impressed with this guy. I don't care about the Christian evangelical kind of stuff. Somebody's got to grab the reality of these extended consciousness realm and try and tackle it. And I don't have to agree with his entire overlay, as we kept saying, but we will go back and talk to him again about that as well, to, to say that at least he's confronting some of the data. Really interested to see what some of you think about this show. Of course, my favorite place to do that and to connect with you is the Skeptico Forum. I'm hoping we'll get some good conversation going over there about that. And be sure to check out the Skeptico website where you can get all these shows for free for download, no paywall, no ads. How do we do it? It's really not that expensive to run a podcast. And I like sharing all this stuff with you and with other folks who don't know about it yet, who you're going to go and tell them they should listen to this only if they should. And we have a lot of them up there. You can see some on the screen, but you already know there's over, uh, oh, I don't know, 350 at this point. But Please check out more episodes and share them as you will. I got some good ones coming up. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.